I am uh, Ashley Halliday Schmantz, and I am um, the kind of the program director of our homeless programs uh, for uh, the Northwest Michigan um, site. So that's number two. So on the on the screen, that's uh, number two. We have this fun um, continuum of care that involves five balance of state, uh, five uh, independent jurisdictions with our COC. So when we're talking about um, kind of the system work that we've done with CSH through YHDP, it's for five of our rural 10 counties. Um, the largest city in our, I'll just do a little bit of scaling. I don't want to spend a ton of time on this because kind of who cares, but um, just for some scaling, the largest city um, within those five counties is about 15,000 people. Um, and then people within those five counties think that is uh, Manhattan. So uh, it's uh, to some folks in the really rural areas of our um, jurisdiction, that is the main, that's like the Mecca, right? So um, the COC before YHDP um, only received about $707,000 through the HUD competition. Um, and that's uh, really a lot of that, probably about 600,000 of that is permanent supportive housing. Um, and that's only about 60 to 70 units uh, for those five counties. Uh, YHDP more, I think more than doubled the allocation. Um, so when we talk about you can't do this without YHDP. Some of it we couldn't, but a lot of it we could. So like looking back, all that system stuff that Kevin was talking about, totally could have done all of that without YHDP, not without his help, um, <laughs> but uh, without the funding. Um, what we couldn't have done is the actual um, funding of the projects. So rapid rehousing funding alone now in our five counties gets $850,000. So rapid rehousing alone for youth is more than the total HUD allocation for everything in our COC. Um, so it's huge. We had nothing for young people. Um, when we went to, oh, I can't go back. I was gonna go back to Kevin's slides, but um, when we did that system map, we had like all blanks when we were talking about young people. We had nothing there. So huge to get YHDP. Um, for rapid rehousing, uh, we have a pregnant and parenting uh, rapid rehousing program for 18 to 24 year olds, and then we have a single youth rapid rehousing program. Um, over 24, we have about 97,000 uh, in that we will be getting this competition around um, in October for all um, all populations, um, and then we have like this much state regulated ESG that's terrible <laughs> um, and it doesn't go very long um, and it's pretty high barrier to get into so that's kind of what we're working with um, and I heard somebody ask us right when we were trying to mess with the computers why are we seeing unaccompanied youth in rural communities what are the reasons they're the exact same reasons so um, that was kind of an eye-opener for us we thought young people in rural communities were gonna have all these other reasons I don't know what we thought they were but all these other reasons um, for entering homelessness, and they're not, they're the same. It's highly, I would say, 100% of the youth that we're serving, um, it's because of family instability, right? So addictions, abuse, neglect, all that stuff is happening um, in rural communities. We're also seeing pr uh, a pretty high even though we're urban and really super white, oh my God, it's white people everywhere. <laughs> um, super white, but it, the, dis the racial disparity is still there. So it's still in our rapid rehousing project, um, the disparity is evident. So it, it is still there in rural communities. Um, still challenging to find affordable housing. Um, and I'll get to one of our projects that I think is pretty replicable in, um, rural communities. Um, we still find that true housing choice can be difficult to provide. Sometimes you're giving young people one option or stay on the street. And that's not true housing choice. We all know that. But unfortunately, that's the reality sometimes. Um, and then rapid rehousing, when you think about it from like the program level, it's the exact same. You're doing it from a housing first perspective. It's client driven. Um, you're using the same tools and approach that you do anywhere else in the, in the country. Um, we're providing move-in and rental assistance. When we go back to Kevin's system map, um, 
our rapid rehousing program um, goes up to 24 months. We're hopeful that young people don't need that long. Um, we're doing, we do the approach of asking young people what they need and how much they think they'll need when they come into the program. So we're not saying it's two years long on the day before two years, you gotta figure something else out. Um, we're asking them in the very beginning, what type of assistance are you looking for as related to case management? And then what type of rental assistance do you think you'll need kind of long term to, to, get, um, to get on your own? And sometimes that means transitioning to permanent supportive housing, but we're actually not there yet because we just started in October. So um, a thing, uh, one thing I think is unique, and Kevin briefly touched on this, um, is that young people don't always want to leave their community. So if they're in one of those outlying villages, <laughs> um, they don't want to come into the Manhattan of uh, northern Michigan, right? So they want to stay there. So we have to tailor um, supports and services to the need of those communities. Um, one thing I found pretty eye-opening um, is that we have a lot of young people staying in unsafe situations for a really, really long time because there is nothing else. So we have one, well, we have one youth shelter that nobody wants to go to. Shocker, right? Um, so we have one youth shelter and then we have um, a couple seasonal shelters, but our main um, shelter system is in that big city. And so if you're out in these outlying communities, you have no shelter, you have to drive sometimes an hour, hour and a half to access um, the only shelter we do have, and people just don't wanna do that. So they're thinking, okay, do I stay in this really terrible situation longer? Or do I uproot everything I know, any sort of stability that I have and come into this big community? Um, and a lot of times they're choosing not to. So when they're staying in unsafe situations, we a lot of times can't find them, we don't know about it. Uh, and then the trauma and all of that is just compounded, compounded, compounded. So that was something um, kind of lesson learned and unique that we saw. Um, I think these guys both touched on responding to the uniqueness of every <laughs> community across the area. Um, every community is unique, um, but really what we're, what a lot of what my job is, is to go into the communities and try to convince them that the framework's the same. If you take that system map that Kevin talked about, that can be applied to any community in this country. It doesn't, it doesn't only work in New York City, right? It can work everywhere. You just have to tailor it to what the resources that you have. Um, and then another lessons learned, if you're thinking about building out rapid rehousing programs and like from the ground up and hiring your case management staff, because we're in areas that have sometimes like nothing else, no other resources, you really want to get people on your team that are connectors, like that are really good at connecting to other things and kind of are okay with a very broad job description. <laughs> um, because if you want, we made the mistake of hiring people that thought, like a lot of clinical expertise, which is important um, in the way beginning, um, but they wanted like kind of a black and white description of what the job is. And in rural communities, when you start getting out out in the weeds, <laughs> um, out in these communities, you have to do a lot more than maybe what you thought just because the resources aren't there. Um, so we have people now who are very good at connecting to community. You want people building relationships with the people in the community, not always saying, well, the only service is in this big city over here. Um, you wanna really embed in the community. Um, this is always a struggle, um, but it's important to have collective alignment around system change. So what does it mean to end homelessness in your community? This is what it means for USICH and what we think it means, but what does it mean in your community and what does that look like? Um, we had the struggle in the beginning of thinking there were um, a million <laughs> homeless youth in our community and we're still, so in the beginning we kept hearing these numbers of overcount, I thought overcounting. Um, there's all these people, they're everywhere, all this stuff. So we're like, okay, we're gonna focus a lot of our time in the beginning of building this really robust street outreach team. And we did that and they're great, um, but we're still not finding the numbers. So then when you do all this work, um, <coughs> you do um, the community work and then you do the actual on the ground outreach work and they're still not there, um, then you kind of, 
might be in an overcounting situation. <laughs> um, so it's, you have to always be iterating every single day. Um, and then we had to explore non-traditional rapid rehousing placements or partnerships within the community. So we're focusing a lot. No one has opted into this option yet um, of young people, but um, to do shared housing, we've done a lot of programmatic build out of that, um, but young people are not wanting to do that yet. So, but it's there if they want it. So that's how we're providing more youth choice, um, or I'm sorry, housing choice for youth. Um, we have a partnership with the Housing Commission. Um, we don't have a ton of super wealthy agencies that can, um, or even um, a lot. We have some philanthropy, but not a ton um, to really like build out um, site-based models or like buy a house and, and do this. So um, we had to get creative there. And one of those partnerships was with our local housing commission. Um, whoops. Which is this. Not perfect. <laughs> um, this is our housing, um, our housing commission um, decided, uh, I think, a year and a half ago that they were going to renovate an old hotel um, and turn that into 60 affordable housing units um, for our community. And they were going to dedicate 14 to young people. <coughs> yes. Sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. Is your housing commission um, a public housing authority? Is yes. That what you're meaning? Okay. Yep. Oh, sorry, PHA. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> well, we don't say commissioning. OK. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yep. Um, uh, what was I saying? Oh, so 14 of those units were going to be and are dedicated for uh, young people who are 18 to 24 years old. Uh, there's one on-site mentor, so that person is there 24-7. Um, not a case manager, but really there to do community building events, shared learning, and then just be like a RA in a dorm um, for the young people. Uh, to make this project happen, we had to leverage a lot of community dollars to make the construction and the renovation happen. Um, the funding for those 14 units um, is HUD rapid rehousing dollars. It's not, they're not voucher based, so it's not like they're project based vouchers or housing choice vouchers in there. Um, it's strictly HUD um, COC rapid rehousing dollars. Um, and what I will say, a lesson learned here. <laughs> Um, we thought um, this partnership was going to be um, not perfect, um, but um, it was going to allow us a lot of to just kind of put our model in there, and that's not what's happening. Um, so what I think we could have done differently in the beginning was educate the ownership, the developers, the landlord, all, we're none of that, so we're just we only get these 14 units and then um, get to hear about it from everybody else. So um, when you don't have that like ownership or just even property management on the, of the COC, um, it's tough. So we're finding that um, the, uh, the whatever property manager is having um, some issues with just kind of issues, young people, and not even young people, just people exiting homelessness face, right? So bringing in 14 people from the streets into, into the unit, right? Totally normal, see that every single day. Um, this person has never seen that before. So hindsight, you know, we could have done a lot more education on the front end. I think we're, why we didn't um, was because this was the first time this has ever happened in our community, and we were really weary around like someone backing out of that. So. Now we just have to be super transparent as, and it's just so much communication um, all the time. Um, but we have uh, 11 of the 14 units, uh, 10, I think 10 of the 14 units filled. Um, everyone is, has stayed housed <laughs> so far. Yes. Um, there's 60 total. And then they're calling it workforce housing. Um, they're, it's kind of, it's not um, strictly income based, but it's, um, I, I know there's a limit of how much you can make um, to live there, but the one bedrooms are going for around 990. In our community, that's pretty high for <laughs> workforce housing. Um, but yeah, and it's mixed population. So another thing that we're trying to do with um, 
the mentor right now is work with him to engage some of the um, other community members that live there to really work with the youth and do some community building stuff there. Yes? Are the youth units subsidized? By the HUD Rapid Rehousing. Yep. So we have um, their whatever fair market rent is um, for one bedroom. And then over time, so our COC operates from the model of, um, oh, who was it? Um, I can't remember. A community that's very involved with Point Source Youth through the Rapid Rehousing Toolkit. Um, we do the model of gradually increasing um, their, their rent contribution over time. So it's not like month three, they pay 30%. It's month one to three, they're paying 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, and then over time. So at the end of it, they're used to paying 100%. Um, it's almost like a TLP model. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes. Um, do you connect them to education or mm -hmm. workforce? or things like that mm -hmm. so that they can step up in the contribution? Yes, yep. Several of them, I don't have my numbers in front of me, but several of them have already increased employment. Um, I'm gonna kinda go back on what I said before about young people didn't want to leave those small communities. When this came online, people did. So right. people wanted to live in this model um, and where in the outlying communities, there's not a lot of job resources, there's no education resources outside of high school, um, coming here increase the opportunities. So, yes. Um, I'm in a rural community in Western Michigan. Mm -hmm. and one of the biggest barriers for finding to increase income and making rapid rehousing successful is transportation. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you plan for transportation issues and mm -hmm. housing choice and, and employment education? Sure. Um, with this site, um, we actually have, um, with our public transportation authority, they have a free line that kind of runs, it was because of this that they started that. So, um, I'm sorry, not a, I don't know that it's free all the time. I don't know what I, but it's connected to this, it kind of goes, so in our community we have like this main drag of like a lot of businesses, a lot of, um, places where young people are going to work, um, very touristy community. So the transportation line that was directly associated with this that was brand new kind of hits all those stops. So they can get on here and go stop to stop. And that happened with a lot of um, advocacy above my level of people on that board um, and then the board through the PHA. Um, what we're doing uh, for the outlying communities is building it into like your mileage. So that's something to think about just when you're um, building out your case management structure, you know that transportation is going to be part of that. So um, knowing to budget enough for transportation. Um, uh, we have transport. It's rough, though. I mean, I, I don't have the magic bullet <laughs> answer for how do I connect somebody that's an hour away from the main city. And um, we do it a lot through, yeah, just tweaking the budget. Yes. Sorry, it's not the only place. So okay. this is one of many places. We act, this acts as an option. So it's scattered site, really. Um, I know it doesn't look like it. <laughs> um, but uh, we have young people housed here, and then we have young people housed private landlords out in the private market. Okay, yep. Yes. Um, I'm thinking about um, the, the COC dynamic for COC funding, and then this is almost 900000 right? So when the YHTP money goes away, how do you fund it? Because our COC is concerned that we will yeah. displace funds from programs that have been funded for years and years. So it won't go away. It'll just become part of your regular allocation. The YHTP money does? Yes. Mm -hmm. Rolls into your ARD. Yeah, mm -hmm. but planning. Yep. Except your ARD increases, and then you get more planning. Yep. Right? Yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But what it does force you to do is start the conversation now. Like we started a year ago having the conversation of when this comes into the regular allocation, what happens? And that's when youth become really important in that decision making body to be there and advocate for this money to stay there. Because when it goes into the regular allocation, you could just put it in PSA or whatever you want. It's not 
protect, well, is it we protected know. this we time? Don't we maybe? don't know yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know yeah. yet because the COC NOFA hasn't been announced. Right. And this is the first year that YHDP round one will be coming into the regular COC competition. So, so read, there's, there's no read the NOFA. It will be in the NOFA. There will be in the NOFA. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and when we receive that. Will those be funded ultimately by COC funding? So host homes are usually funded under, well, have to be funded under an SSO project. Uh, under YHCP, you are open up to all the project components, right? So you actually can fund SSOs, you can fund uh, TH, and so um, you're supportive operationalizing, services. I'm sorry, supportive services only grant, and so you're operationalizing your host homes under a supportive services only grant. Um, but they all stay renewable in your, in your competition when you go to renew in two years. And kind of how we're thinking about host homes, we have a very underutilized host home model in our COC through um, RHY funding. Um, no, you know, underutilized. I don't know that we had anyone in it last year. So, and we know that's a gap. Young people are saying that's kind of, they're telling us we don't want to go into shelter and we're like, okay. You know, and then there's no other option. So, um, what we're doing is through, um, is that partnership piece that Kevin talked a lot about, cross systems collaboration. If we didn't have that collaboration with the RHY provider, um, we wouldn't have been able to be flexible with the host homes. And so what we're doing is um, we're funding a coordinator out of our um, diversion services through YHDP um, to uh, build out a more robust host home program. So it's not gonna be directly funded, like the stipends for the homes and things like that are not gonna be directly funded through uh, COC dollars, but um, the coordination and the build out of it will be. And then the case management of the young people in the homes uh, will also be funded by um, the diversion work that we do. Um, I think it's our, uh, my last one. Um, I didn't talk a lot about it throughout this, but I think our biggest lesson learned was just ask young people what they want and they will tell you. Like, it's not that difficult. Um, our community gets super in the like, talking about everything at nauseam um, and uh, it's like just ask young people just go ask them like now when we talk about what April was saying what people in programs that is a little more sensitive right so we don't want to think um, or have young people think oh my program slot is you know linked to what I tell you about how great your program is so that's a little bit different that's gonna take um, a little bit more time. Uh, but in the beginning of your planning process, just ask them. So that East Bay Flats model um, totally came out of a young person's idea. They kept telling us, we don't, we're not really ready to like, some people are, but the group that we asked this time, we're not really ready to like live way out in the middle of nowhere or whatever on our own. We want that support of other young people going through this. And then they wanted that resident assistant mentor on site. That was not something we came up with. They want that, they wanted that support. So what that originally looked like was us purchasing a house through community investment dollars, um, us purchasing like a single standing house, that fell through. Again, rural community, nobody has enough money to make that happen and when the deal fell through, we had to figure out like, oh God, how do we still make this work? Mm -hmm. And then that looked like partnership. So, um, yeah, and then I think the only, the thing I'll kind of leave with is um, really the system focus. So Kevin talked a lot about when you're bringing the group in the beginning to the table, it has to be people who think at a systems level. It has to be systems thinkers. If you have people at the table who just want to do things the way you used to do things, that doesn't end homelessness because we haven't ended youth homelessness yet. Um, if you have everybody around the table that just wants to do things the same way, it's not going to work. Um, and so I think we started probably half and half. <laughs> um, and now we've um, worn people down enough uh, that, <laughs> that they're coming to the table in a different way. Um, but some of that too has been, um, some of our community investment dollars are bringing systems thinking training to our COC and to maybe some of the people we've targeted that need a little bit more assistance in that. Um, <laughs> they don't know that. but. Um, so bringing them to the table in a different way has significantly helped because if you, we were this way three years ago, we know what we're doing. We, rural communities are so unique and nothing where like, 
all these systems are only for you know big cities, um, but a few of us knew different. And so if you can really identify the, like in our community, maybe like four people <laughs> that thought different, um, it totally shifted it. So, questions? Uh, you could probably in our community separate that out. Juvenile justice, zero. Um, still working on it. Um, child welfare is at the table. Would I say the partnership is where we want? No. Um, they're at the table, but then we get into, and I, I don't think this is unique to rural, but these political nightmares of I can't talk to this person unless I've talked to these 14 people. Um, so we're, we're dealing a little bit with that, um, but once our program started, we got past the planning phase and we just started working with young people, it became so much easier. The case managers would just call the child welfare case managers and we didn't get into this hierarchy thing. The hierarchy thing is still a struggle and Kevin is still helping our community three years later on <laughs> engaging the right people there. I think one of the biggest lessons we learned through YCP in that is it is really easy when you're doing this type of work to just go to, I let's say I'm an RHY provider and I know the uh, extended foster care case manager, let's invite them to the table and mm -hmm. start planning with them. And I'm not saying that's not great because you need those people at the table, but mm -hmm. to Ashley's point, you also need the systems mm -hmm. level people at the table. And so what happened a lot of around one communities is that they just had, unfortunately, uh, two not the right level of decision mm -hmm. maker at the table. So you need both, right? You want the folks that are actually working with youth in the child welfare system, but you also need, like, maybe it's your regional administrator at the child welfare agency. They might not come to the table every time you meet, but maybe it's like a monthly meeting with your decision makers where you're keeping them in the loop. Because you do, I mean, we all know how state uh, government works sometimes, right? Like, you don't make a decision down here. You make a decision mm -hmm. way up here, and so you need those people bought into the process. And so my biggest recommendation is leverage that early. Like, mm -hmm. figure out how you get them interested early in the process and regular in the process to actually be part of that. And one of the biggest ways to do that is to, especially in the under 18 space, mm -hmm. and through data and through the system modeling is to actually show uh, the child welfare agency and the juvenile justice system that this is helping them too, right? Like we've been framing it uh, as, especially in some of the round two communities where we're experimenting even deeper in this work is like, this is an alternative way to think about uh, all of our systems, right? So like, how do you make the case that this is going to reduce the young people that you're actually putting in detention, right? If you reduce, if you reduce homelessness, often homelessness and detention in the juvenile system are very much linked. And same with child welfare, right? Like if you can reduce uh, homelessness and offer more supports into family-based settings for young people under the age of 18, you're going to take less young people into care. Therefore, you're going to spend less money mm -hmm. at the state on child welfare. So you have to be able to talk mm -hmm. in that way to systems levels where often what we usually do is we're talking about like this young person in extended foster care, what can we do for them? And that's great, but you also gotta be up here and be thinking about how you're gonna save money for other state systems by all working together. Good. Okay. Wait, can I have a question? Oh, yeah. Um, and building your each day class model, mm -hmm. um, we've kind of looked at possibly doing that kind of to come in the future, mm -hmm. but we have concerns about protecting our youth from predators who are making like a habit of um, going after at-risk youth. Um, have you had any issue with that or like in what, what do you mean? Like trying to get involved in order to like take advantage of the youth that you're helping. Oh, with. no. <laughs> um, you know, no, um, I wouldn't call them predator, <laughs> I would oh. say. So it's not like that yeah, severe. Yeah. We definitely have um, <laughs> some, uh, you know, volunteer type situations that are going on um, that we're finding. We knew with adults we had those and they were unhealthy and now we have had the situation. Um, a couple um, volunteer doing very anti what we're doing, right? That young people make the decisions. They have the choice and we, we have some folks that are still on the mindset of I'm parenting them, I'm doing um, this for them, they do what I tell them. So we do have that, um, it's rare though, yeah. But not in that model specific, that's um, other, other system. 
I, I do think, I mean, I know where you're going with this, though, because yeah. we have seen in other communities, right, like they've done this type of model, and then all of a sudden, a uh, drug selling ring opens up, like, right next door, right? Mm -hmm. Like, they're targeting, whether it's trafficking or whether it's drugs, like, they find out where young people, um, and so in that specific community I'm thinking of, like, it's why, again, the systems level thinking and work together is, yeah. right, like, because you have uh, kind of local police engaged and engaged in a way that isn't, like, targeting young people to arrest them, right? Like, it's like, yeah, sure. you actually have uh, that type of collaboration at the table from the beginning. Uh, this also this sense of, like, community building that you do with mm -hmm. young people in the community, right? Like, sometimes we found that young people themselves actually have ways to, like, protect each other and think about, mm -hmm. right? And so being open and honest about a conversation of, like, the police are telling us, right, that a heroin house is open next door. Mm -hmm. Like, what do we, what do you all need, like, to stay safe? Like, what mm -hmm. do you want? What do you want the boundaries to be, right? So, I mean, actually putting young people in the driver's seat of how they want to engage in the community and how they want to engage with the police or not engage with the police in the community to, to stay safe. And that's like the huge thing, that, like just ask them. Like that's what we, it's like we want to get in these big like planning things and all this stuff and it's like just ask them how they can stay safe from something that's happening like that. Our Youth Action Board, that kind of reminded me, um, they want to engage with the police. So they want to educate our police force on how to be more youth centered and all of that stuff. So that's another way to use your YAB or Youth Action Board um, to really um, engage the stuff on a community level. Mm -hmm. I just want to know if your Youth Action Board could work on that community center nobody wants to go with. Oh, um, the shelter. Uh, <laughs> we're trying. <laughs> yeah, um, so that, um, that involves a lot of this bottom part. So are we intentionally focused on how we are both part of the problem and part of the solution? And that takes a long time for um, people that have been invested in their agency for many, many years <laughs> to come to the realization that, oh, some of what I'm doing is part of the problem. Not everything, um, but here's how I can be part of the solution. But the part that's a problem, we need to change. And so we're really lucky um, in some of the agencies involved in this, they have that level of thinking, um, and some we don't. So we just have to engage them in a different way. I um, mean, keep asking them that question. Sure. Mm -hmm. And authentically listening, right? Yes. I think like, the other piece <laughs> to this is like, and I think that East Bay Flats is a really good example of this, is what we might have heard three years ago from young people is, I want a group home type setting. I don't mm -hmm. want to live alone. It's not really what they're, right? Like when you really dug in, they don't want to share a room. Mm -mm. They don't want uh, high barrier curfews and guest mm -hmm. policies. And so what they really wanted was they wanted their own apartment, but they wanted their own apartment and independence mm -hmm. in a more group setting. Like we all, when we were 21 mm -hmm. years old and we lived with a bunch of 21 year olds in an apartment mm -hmm. building, right? So I think we have to be careful on what like we assign young people saying versus what they're actually saying. Um, because what they actually were saying is what East Space Blast turned into, mm -hmm. right? I think if, that house deal right. actually would have went through, it wouldn't have been as successful right. as East Bay Blast, right. because that house situation would have turned into high barrier, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. curfew type housing, which is not what young people actually were asking for in this specific right. Okay. Good. Okay. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So we have about 30 more minutes. Uh, does anyone have any questions for our amazing presenters. Anything else lingering for you? Okay, great. Well, then I'm going to ask you all some questions um, and pick your brains a little bit for the crowd here. Um, so, um, do, do, do. so many, many systems are making a shift in coordinated entry from adult serving to also being youth friendly um, and having youth specific services. Uh, what has this looked like in your work? And anyone can answer that. Um, I feel like you're looking at it. <laughs> <laughs> so in our um, system, like I said, we had a pretty built out coordinated entry system, but it was only for adults. There was very little accommodation ever made for young people. Um, so what we built into that was a more robust street outreach program um, where we have uh, two and a half um, <laughs> for families too. Um, but dedicated street outreach workers who are specifically trained um, in how to engage young people. 
uh, we didn't have that before. So we had, we, our coordinated entry system um, to get access to it is a call center uh, with some street outreach, um, but probably not enough in the adult serving world. So with youth, we are very specific around we need assessors who are out away from the call center. Um, and so that looks like going, partnering with um, the alternative high school. That's a huge referral source um, into the system. So having dedicated days um, at all the high schools. So we have a map of our coordinated entry kind of access. Uh, we have a map of every high school, every, well, there's only one community college, but um, all, of, all of these points of entry um, and different days and times that our outreach staff are going there to assess people. Um, another huge gap that we found that is, the program has been very successful is adding diversion uh, in a robust diversion system. That was something, uh, funding we could, we would have, um, had to have used uh, community dollars uh, had it not been for YHDP, but uh, we built out a diversion uh, case management system. So what Kevin was talking about, uh, young people um, at risk of becoming homeless can um, get linked up with uh, six months at most of case management services through diversion. Um, and then what we also found through that is the financial aspect of that is very little. Um, it's the case management and the problem solving that's helping most people. And we have right now a roughly 80% success rate of keeping people out of the system through that. So that was a huge part of building out coordinated entry as well. Yeah, I think we're seeing that in a lot of the YHDP communities actually, like building out this robust diversion system and thinking about that as part of your coordinated entry system, right? And so like diversion is the first thing that you try, right? And not just diversion in terms of like Ashley's saying, it's not like, okay, can you stay somewhere tonight? Great, like now coordinated entry is done, we're done, diversion's yeah. done, we're closing the door. It's actually like, it is case management, it's the problem solving of actually helping a young person say, okay, maybe tonight it's here, and maybe tomorrow night it's at an aunt's house, and that'll stabilize you for a couple weeks until mm -hmm. we figure out what like, your long, long term, right? So it's it's this like following a young person along that pathway um, and supporting them in each step, uh, letting them make the decision around what's safe, what's stable for me to go to and keeping, um, keeping that in. I'd say the other thing in especially rural communities around coordinated entry that I would say is really trying to slowly but surely make coordinated entry look the same across uh, boundaries, right? And so uh, again, in Washington, Mountains of State, that has looked like regionalized uh, approaches where there's clusters of anywhere from like three to six counties mm -hmm. that are actually for the first time coming together and saying, okay, like it doesn't matter if I'm providing rapid rehousing in X county and you came and you live in Z county, you're all in the same balance of state. I think sometimes we think of balance of states and they start to think of each county thinks of itself as its own COC, but it's not, right? So you have the ability for young people to move around and for you to provide those services there. That takes some budgeting, like uh, Ashley was saying, right? Because if you were used to just providing case management for your rapid rehousing in this county, and now you gotta drive uh, an hour over into the next county, yeah, that takes time, but it's more successful, right? And so I think um, figuring out how you actually get your players on the same page around mm -hmm. getting rid of those county lines and having a more regionalized coordinated entry has been successful as well. Yeah, absolutely. April, do you have anything to add about that? Well, I think, you know, again, I come from mostly an urban area, and our uh, coordinated entry for the youth system was built out about 15 years ago. So they lended to our adult system and how we created that. And so they already have processes in place. They had partnerships with some of the larger agencies that were receiving funding. Um, so they could use targeted youth services, but I'm gonna piggyback on the regionalizing. Mm -hmm. In the balance of state in Georgia, we have, like I said, several state agencies. So we are all broken out into our own regions, you know, about 15 counties-ish each. Um, so we are working on streamlining those regions so that DFACS, TANF, you know, um, CJC, CDCAL, and the balance of state all sort of have the same re regions where, because we're really looking at how we can look at these youth in one place, in one region, without giving away too much of their information, but really being able to um, serve them in a more uh, meaningful way on a regional level. So there's no wrong door. 
Awesome, thank you. Um, I really liked something you said about how, you know, HUD might have a different definition for youth homelessness and how it looks in your community um, and that you still need to make a plan for how people are experiencing homelessness in your community, right? Um, I was wondering if any of you could talk to the kind of funding streams that you have found to do that work um, and how to access them. Yeah, so I mean, I think uh, the bigger point that we have been trying to move through YHDP is a couple things I'd say, right? Like, we can't avoid the big elephant in the room around definition, right? I feel like we shy away from that sometimes, and it's like, it's there, right? There is a reason why HUD defines in one way, there is a reason why another system defines in another way. What we talk about in YHDP is draw your circle where you want to draw your circle, right? So, like, as a community, decide who you think the most at risk uh, you are in your community that you need to be inside that circle, and then figure out what the funding streams for that circle actually are, right? One of the things we found, uh, and Ashley talked a lot about this, especially in rural communities, is that a lot of young people actually probably qualify under the HUD definition, under category four, which is mm -hmm. for non-HUD folks in the room, that is fleeing what you people used to traditionally think as fleeing domestic violence, but what we really pushed is really about fleeing any you know unsafe situation right and so what we're really finding is that a lot of times we think in rural communities they don't qualify they don't qualify because they're still living they're housed over here yeah but they're housed over here in a situation that that young person if you ask them they would say yeah it's extremely unsafe I don't want to stay here but yeah. I don't have a shelter to go to so what do you want me to do right and so those young people qualify right if a young person is trying to flee the housing situation because there's abuse happening, there is emotional abuse happening, there's drugs happening in the house that they don't want to be around, all of that qualifies. Um, so one, I'd start with, I'd argue that actually a lot of young people fit under the HUD definition uh, and do qualify, uh, mm -hmm. which is what I think uh, Ashley was saying they're actually finding uh, in their rural community. Um, and then the other piece is some won't, right? Perhaps some simply will not. Um, and so you have to figure out what those other funding streams are. In some states, that might mean you actually have, like it's becoming more and more um, common for there to be state funded kind of homeless youth uh, systems that run on kind of a parallel um, of, of uh, other funding. Um, I think thinking more broadly about your RHY funding, if you have runaway and homeless youth dollars, right, the, the definitions around who can be served within runaway and homeless youth dollars is a bit different um, then, and so that has been some of the work uh, that Ashley was kind of hinting at that we're doing with the RHY provider in, in Northwest Michigan is actually saying like, okay, we now have all of this new money that can serve young people in this community. You are serving a slice of this pie. Maybe you, like, you slice of your pie is a little bit over here now, right? Because we got this covered with YSP money, so now you can focus on those doubled up young people that might not be able to fit within the HUD definition. So part of it is actually figuring out how you, I would argue, use your RHY and your COC dollars together to be serving different young people that all fit within your same pie. Um, and then the other thing I'd say is, it's hard, and yes, we don't all have philanthropy in our communities, but what some of this modeling does is it actually gives you a map to say, like, there is a cost behind, we know what we need. We need 55 units of this. COC is gonna cover 25 of it. Mm -hmm. 20 are not gonna happen over here. Like, there's a cost to this. There's a mapping to this. We have a plan for you. Philanthropy likes when you have a plan for them with a the budget behind, right? Like, they like to see that you thought it all out, and they like to see that you're leveraging your public dollars. So use that as a, as opposed to kind of just going in and we need all of these things, you're coming in with a very like specific slice of the pie. Um, how would you tell people to get started on bringing people to the table and building that capacity without that YHDP funding? You guys started some of it without YHDP. <laughs> well, we started um, several years ago. So I guess engaging what's already there. So there is this, um, thing called the Homeless Youth Initiative. It's slowly kind of dissipating at this point, um, but that was the only thing that existed for service providers who were serving youth to get around the table and say, I don't know what they were doing, I wasn't a part of it, but um, get. I think they were getting around the table and saying, where are the gaps, what can we do? And it took the chair, the only reason we even applied for YHDP was because of the chair of that committee. So again, going back to engaging those champion people that want to do this and want to think different, um, that chair came to the COC every single meeting and said, what about young people? What about youth? 
what about all this stuff that you're talking about involves young people? Um, and I was like, oh, be quiet. <laughs> you know? So then it was like, oh no, this, this is, because again, COC minded, like me, data, da I, where are the numbers? Like you can't just keep saying there's all these people. Um, so then we really got to a place with that initiative of, um, they did a focus group funded by philanthropy of what young people in our community actually needed, not just the one adult saying, hey, what about them? They need, we needed that um, to be the jumping off point. Um, but then we funded focused, focus groups and uh, some surveys around uh, how many young people there might be uh, and what they need. And then that jumped us off to mm -hmm. YHDP. So that could have just continued. That could have then just become a committee of our COC without YHDP, and we could have done all this this planning work. I think um, in terms of the balance, our balance of state, I just had to start talking to our providers. I fortunately got connected with Point Source um, prior to when I started. They had tried to connect knowing we were working on it, but working on um, the YHDB, but I, in the balance of state, it's very relational. Mm -hmm. So I started going out into communities, to our agencies, really talking to them about what they needed, what their gaps were, because we didn't have a lot of data. And um, I started attending other state agency meetings to find out their goals, mm -hmm. specifically t uh, DFACs, child welfare, and found out a lot of them have the same goals that we do. They just have a different response. Mm -hmm. They have a different focus. So what we've done most recently is sat down together and talked about what are, what are each other's goals, what are each other's required outcomes, and we're taking it from there. The other thing is we are gonna put some points in our NOFA around communities that are engaging with their local government offices, you know, their local agencies, which is a huge deal because sometimes as a COC, we find our, we have found ourselves doing more for our agencies than we need to, and then it's not a group effort, you know, there's no buy-in. So it's a lot, it's a, it's a process, and I'm surprised it's gotten done this <coughs> quickly, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that common goal piece is it's so huge. across the system is so huge. Like, we there's a site we're working with now where it's they really found out like their numbers of 16 and 17 year olds that they were bringing into to, to foster care were just going off the charts. Mm -hmm. And then when they dug into it, what they figured out it was because they had done juvenile justice reform and they were not incarcerating those young people again, which is a huge win. I'm not saying that's <laughs> not a good thing. It's a great thing. But the response then from the judge was to say, well, like, we don't know what to do, so we're gonna mandate you into child welfare. Mm -hmm. And so when everyone kind of came together, we had this like, just huge aha moment at one meeting where everyone was like, we're talking about the same young people mm -hmm. and none of us are doing it right, right? Like the homeless response system's not doing it right, yeah. child welfare's not doing that, juvenile justice system's not doing it right. So let's come up with a common goal and then figure out how we share responsibility. Share responsibility means share money too, right? So yep. like each system has to figure out where their piece of the pie is but when you all start speaking the same language and realize that you're speaking about the exactly. same young people, it just mm -hmm. totally shifted the conversation away from like me pointing at child welfare and being like, why are you putting them in crappy foster care? And me saying, don't lock them up, right? Like right. you have to shift the entire dynamic to start <laughs> speaking the same language around one common goal. Yep, yep. Yeah. And it's a process. But yes, it takes <laughs> And I'm a bugaboo, and that, that's part of it. You know, in, in rural areas, like I said, it's very relational. You know, in the city and the urban areas, it's a little easier. I can, I'm at meetings with different people, but this has been a quite a big <coughs> challenge for us. Are there any systems or partnerships that maybe haven't been mentioned that we should let people know about beyond child welfare and juvenile justice? I want to say healthcare. Okay, great. I know in the rural communities, um, especially in Georgia, we struggle with that, but in my experience, Healthcare dollars have done a lot of funding for housing, and they're often very much less restrictive and can go in a lot of different directions. So
So we are bringing the health department for the state of Georgia at, to the table just to kind of see what communities they're touching and see, you know, finding out what the gaps are. And there might be a whole bunch of youth here that we're missing that are coming out of, you know, hospitals or treatment agencies or, or whatever. So healthcare, I think, is a mm -hmm. it's a big deal. And then like the big umbrella, right? Like thinking about what piece. Like maybe it's the state agency where getting excited about a potential with a managed care organization in rural Washington that uh, kind of found out about the project and really is seeing yep. their young people uh, specifically coming out of behavioral health yep. uh, inpatient and substance abuse that and right so they had this pot of money with the managed care to be doing case management and they're like we have some case management but like we have nothing in terms of we have no idea in this rural community where to house them and we're saying like we have YHP money that's paying for some house like so how do we actually marry those two things um, because Washington State is actually seeing their highest number of young people experiencing homelessness are coming directly out of inpatient behavioral health centers. Mm -hmm. Like they are just mm -hmm. straight into homelessness yep. from mm -hmm. within the year. Same yeah. with Oregon, straight into, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Straight into uh, homelessness. It's really sad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other, any questions from the audience? Oh. Okay, great. I'm gonna shift gears a tiny little bit. Um, I would love to hear about what landlord recruitment looks like in rural areas for you. And um, yeah, you can just expand upon that. <laughs> um, it's tough. Um, all of our, so another reason why I said we were kind of sensitive in the beginning on that East Bay Flats model to really get into like, um, I think now what I would do probably is talk to that landlord or the, the director of the PHA around, let's do some training on positive youth development. Let's do some training on what we are doing to end youth homelessness. Um, but we were so sensitive because sometimes with landlords um, at that scale, like 14 dedicated units, we're skittish. Like we don't want to say too much um, and scare people off. Um, so it's always just a balancing act. Um, what um, I think in the, all of the, it's really just around that, um, that business transaction. I mean, make mm -hmm. it about that. We've done both. We've tried to engage landlords around, um, the help us end homelessness and the like feel <coughs> bad for us type story. And that doesn't work long term. Um, there are some people that want to be a landlord be in these programs because of that, and that's fine if they come to the table saying, um, but then you do get into that relationship of, are they gonna step too far into it? Mm -hmm. Are they gonna think they have a different role than just collecting the rent and maintaining the unit? Mm -hmm. um, so we've had that, um, that's been harder, but where we found most success, our most successful implementation of rapid rehousing ever in our continuum of care has been through this uh, youth project. Um, and I, it's been surprising. I think we thought it was going to be the hardest uh, thing to do, that no one was going to want to rent to young people. And actually, most of the people that we've engaged want to. They see this different um, thing with young people that I think has been a mind shift for me personally, too. Um, working, I had not worked with youth uh, prior to this, and many of our landlords hadn't either. But it's like the potential is never ending. Um, chronically homeless folks, we are making the ask in a different way to landlords, and they're kind of like, they chose that, you know, even though we know different. Um, that's kind of the mindset of many of our landlords. With young people, they kind of feel like they have this active role in helping the potential of the young people that are, ju it's just never ending. Yeah. So. I'd say also invest in it, right? What we've been pushing really hard in communities is like, case managers don't always make the best housing locators, mm -hmm. right? Because <laughs> it's a different skill set, right? It is a different skill set, it is not. But we shy away from sometimes in our budgets, and I get it, right? We have small budgets in rural areas where we're like, but if I hire a housing locator, like I am, that's four or less units, maybe, mm -hmm. that I'm funding annually. I'd make the argument that like, you're not gonna find those four units in the first place, unless yeah. you invest in the housing yeah. locator, yeah. Yeah. right? And so you, it, it's just a different set. Like that might be somebody with a real estate background. That might be somebody like completely out of the social work realm that you would never think of hiring into your nonprofit that has a totally different mindset because to Ashley's point, for the most 
part, a lot of it is transactional, right? So it's actually mm -hmm. like figuring out how some of the things you might negotiate with the landlord, like as a social worker, might make us cringe because you're like, oh, that's not how I would have talked about that. Right. Um, but you got to do the business, right? The yeah. dirty work of actually finding the landlord <laughs> sometimes is uh, it's just a different skill set. So invest in it, invest in it. Don't make your case managers go out there and find housing at the same time that they're trying to case manage young people into employment and education and all the other things you ask your case managers to do. So invest in it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And in terms of investing, um, guarantees. If your community has dollars available for landlord guarantees and doing a rent well, mm -hmm. offering rent well in your communities, it's a huge, huge incentive. In addition, it's giving our youth the skills they need to be good tenants. Yep, absolutely. Um, you did say something earlier about true housing choice and affordable housing. Um, how are you balancing that as you plan out these systems? Uh, <laughs> you did. <laughs> um, it's hard. I don't. I think in you're forced into having more, a little more choice when you don't have this model where the yeah. units are dedicated. Um, and that's something we're still trying to, str we're struggling mm -hmm. with. Yeah. Um, we have a couple folks, so when we think about shared housing, um, a perfect example of this, we had two young people present, they said, I want to live, to, we want to live together. They weren't a couple, just friends, roommates. Um, we want to live together, um, but they actually cho ended up choosing this East Bay Flats model. Um, which is all separate apartments, separate everything, they don't share. Um, they ended up choosing that because that was all that was available at the moment. Mm -hmm. So we don't, we didn't have the stock of all these other, we have the shared housing model, um, but we didn't have the unit at the time. So it was like, do we stay homeless longer or do we go into this thing that maybe wasn't our first choice? Um, so it's continued, continued struggle. Um, they're happy and love it and it's actually helping them a little bit <laughs> separate um, a little bit because it can be a little codependent but um, it, it's working out but to have true choice I think it's just it's a struggle everywhere yeah absolutely so, like we want to give people 10 options and <laughs> you know five are really close to what they want but reality is not always that yeah um, we have about eight minutes left. Um, I would love to know what you would tell yourself when you first started implementing these uh, interventions in rural communities, if anything. Any advice you would give yourself? Give yourself a break. <laughs> I'm super perfectionist and I come from a very organized community and um, I need to give myself a break and really thoughtful because this work is it's hard and it's different and we're learning about it every single day and it's okay if we are not absolutely perfect with everything we do because we can always reset and restart and do it a different way mm -hmm. I'm gonna say the cliche thing um, of listen to young people mm -hmm. um, I don't think we our group and myself included was so far gone that we were like didn't want to include them but there are there are still some people in our COC leadership that um, we are every day trying to convince that a, a spot on that board needs to be um, a, young, a young person mm -hmm. um, so I think and then we got into a lot of the I think I've mentioned this a few times how much we like to talk about everything um, we got a lot into the weeds of it and it's really just as simple as asking young people. Just ask them and shut up and then do what they said, you know? Like, mm -hmm. actually be authentic listeners um, and and do what, what they're saying. I think um, to have that balance a little bit of Ash what Ashley was talking about of like, yes, we need to tailor things to the unique needs of rural community, but rural community, <coughs> there is a lot that can be done in rural communities, that you take a framework that works in an urban setting and you adapt it and you make it work in a rural community. 
So I think we, we run into this pitfall too many times in rural communities, like Ashley would say, like you walk into a room and the first thing they want to tell you is this is different because of this, 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 <laughs> this, and it won't work. And it's like, yes, I respect that. I do, I respect that transportation, for example, like it needs to be budgeted because it's a huge difference. Yeah. Like I can't just hop on a free bus and go down the street to my job. Okay, so let's figure out that piece of it. But when we just throw away things like rapid rehousing or host homes because mm -hmm. we say, it won't work because right. we're too rural, we're doing a disservice, right? So we have to figure out how to adapt it and make it work and not just the first answer can't be no because yeah. we're rural, right? Yeah, great. Any other questions from the audience before we part ways? Last chance. Great, well a round of applause for our amazing speakers. Um, thank you so much. And we're on break for lunch, so go before the lines get crazy. <laughs> um.